Thank you. So uh, good evening. My name is Bob Luck, and I'm the president of Twin Cities Trout Unlimited. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the first ever joint meeting of the Gitche Gumi chapter and the Twin Cities chapter of Trout Unlimited. Uh, I'm sure you're all eager to get to the main event, which is a great presentation by Jason Swingen on migratory fish. But before I introduce Jason, I'd like to make a few uh, announcements and also introduce my counterpart from the Gitche Gumi chapter, Brandon Kime. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank all of you who registered on the new events site. I'm not sure how easy or difficult it was, but I'm sure there were at least a few challenges, but I do think that this is something, first of all, it gave us some idea of what the headcount would be tonight. Uh, and then going into the future, it'll give us an idea of you know, what y'all are interested in and might be interested in. <laughs> Let us know a little bit more about our members. So we really appreciate your doing that. Um, and as mentioned in the email, uh, we will be holding a drawing for a box of 48 flies that were hand tied by Paul Johnson. I think I actually have them. Yay, we got your driver's license, your tags for your car. I don't know if I hold it up to my camera if you can see it, but probably shouldn't open the box because the flies will fly all over the place. But we will be having a drawing for everybody who registered and we'll notify the winner after the, 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 the meeting tonight by email. Uh, the second uh, thing I have to announce is this is our first attempt at a hybrid meeting, both live and online. And all the pundits are telling us that hybrid is the future. And of course, we at Trot Unlimited are, want to embrace the future, uh, but I do anticipate we'll have a few glitches. Uh, for example, I forgot the adapter for my computer and Eve there had to run out and get one for me. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, we hope you will bear with us and, uh, I, and uh, accept that there will be a few glitches. And then uh, my final announcement is that we do have one big event coming up. Uh, and that is, I guess I have to close you guys down for a second. Try to do this one more time. There we go. We have a big event coming up. It's our second annual Wild and Scenic Film Festival and year-end celebration. Uh, and this is uh, going to be at the Chaska Community Center on October 23rd. Uh, we're going to have some great films. They're not necessarily fishing films. They're actually films about conserving nature. So if you have members of your household who aren't anglers, they will still enjoy these films. Uh, we'll be holding a silent auction uh, in the week up to the film festival. Uh, for people that attend in person, there will be a happy hour, there will be a food truck, fireman's barbecue, there will be a space where you can get together with your friends before the show and swap tall tales and fishing lies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, all the proceeds that we get uh, from the event will go towards youth education. Uh, this is something that we've really been focusing a lot on in the food cities uh, because uh, uh, if you haven't noticed, those folks up in Gitchigumi or down in southeastern Minnesota, they have a lot more trout streams than we do. But we got a lot of kids. And so we really think there's a great opportunity to do more, more education here in the Twin Cities. So that's why we're going to be uh, putting the proceeds towards youth education. Uh, for more information, since you guys all logged in on the event center, you know where to go. You go to the event center. The link here is not live, but I'm sure that you can find it. Uh, and finally, I should mention that if you do uh, register by October 1st, you will get your very own free Sillipint mug, which is basically a sippy cup for adults. <laughs> Prevents your drink from spilling up, good for both beer and coffee. So you can start your day and end your day with your very own TCTU Sillipint mug if you register by October 1st. So anyway, I need to admit somebody here. Are you guys seeing like all the messages and stuff on the screen too? <laughs> I suppose you probably are. Uh, 
So uh, anyway, without further ado, what I'd like to do next is introduce Brandon Kime, the president of the Gichigumi chapter. All right. Well, thank you, Bob, and good evening. It's great to see so many of you here online tonight. Uh, Want to thank uh, TCTU chapter Bob and Paul Johnson for the partnership and putting this together and offering an awesome door prize. I know Paul's a great tire, and whoever's name is picked, you're going to get one heck of a prize. So good luck to you. Gichigumi Trout Unlimited chapter has a number of exciting online and in-person events coming up for our 2021 and 2022 program year. Uh, our next meeting, which will be online, uh, will be in November, and we're actually featuring Paul Johnson. So the gentleman that uh, put that awesome door prize together, we will have him as our presenter uh, in our November uh, online event. Details on the event and everything else our chapter is planning for the upcoming program year will be listed on our Facebook page. If you haven't been to our Facebook page, we do have an active page. Just search Gumi Trout Unlimited. Give us a like and you'll be following us. We're excited about tonight's event as it's perfect timing. Uh, the Northland has received significant rainfall, which has opened up our river mounts along the Minnesota North Shore rivers and increased the flows along the Wisconsin South Shore rivers. So we hope you all enjoy. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a ton of questions for Jason tonight. And uh, uh, Brandon and I talked about the best way to get questions answered without interrupting the flow of the presentation. And we'd like to request the following. Uh, first, for all of you who are attending the meeting online tonight, feel free to put your questions into the chat. Uh, and Brandon is going to be monitoring those questions. And once Jason finishes his presentation, uh, Brandon will ask him those questions. And you can continue to put questions into the chat uh, you know, at any time, even after Jason is finished. Uh, we are gonna, the, the, the in-person folks that came tonight, uh, they got to drink beer, they get to see some of their friends. So they have a few advantages over the online folks. But one thing we are gonna ask uh, for the in-person folks is that you hold your questions until all the online questions are finished. And then uh, uh, once those are finished, uh, then you can ask your questions to, to Jason. Uh, he's already told me that he's going to stay as long as it takes to answer all your questions. So if we go a little bit past 8.30, no problem. If you have a question or you want to chat with Jason, uh, you can do that. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, with uh, Q&A. Uh, just a couple of other things uh, for the folks that are uh, online, if you could please mute yourself. I think I muted most of you and, and so far we haven't heard any background noise. Uh, that would be great. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, if you could put your phone on mute. Uh, and I should mention that we are recording this Zoom uh, because we had a lot of people interested uh, in seeing a video of the presentation afterwards. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I guess I'd like to have our speaker, uh, Jason Swingin. Here, I'll get him. How do I make him big? Pin him. There we go. He's a web developer, internet marketer, outdoor writer, and fly angler. I think if you would go in terms of what he loves, it might go the other way around. Uh, he grew up in Montana chasing mule deer and antelope, but since moving to Duluth in 2014, he's been primarily focused on catching smallmouth bass and steelhead on flies. He's the vice president of the Gitchigumi chapter of Trout Unlimited, and he's the email campaign manager for Minnesota Trout Unlimited. You can find his work in MNTU newsletters, Lake Superior Steelhead newsletters, on the Minnesota DNR's website, and on Jason's very own blog. So we're very pleased to welcome him tonight. And Jason, I would like to turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. Can you hear me good? Yeah. Yes. Everything's all right? Okay. Cool. I'm going to share. All right. Looks good.
All right. So uh, thanks, Bob. I'm happy to be here. I am going to be talking about uh, targeting migratory trout in Lake Superior today. Um, I'm just going to get kind of right into it. Um, I'm Jason Swingin. Like Bob said, I'm a web developer and internet marketer. Um, I do have a blog, so if you don't get enough information tonight, feel free to go uh, to js-outdoors.com. Um, I have a ton of articles on uh, fly fishing, steelhead, bass, all that stuff. Um, I've built websites uh, for the Fly Fishing Nation, like the Agwaboa Amazon Lodge website and the NFC, uh, Norwegian Fly Fishers Club. Um, I'm very involved in Trout Unlimited. Um, and as of this year, I am a fly fishing guide with Nama Bini. Um, so that's enough about me. I think um, we should just get started on what we're here for. Um, so these are the eight things uh, that I'm gonna be going through today. So all of the things by the end of it, hopefully you will all know, um, but I'll stick around for any questions. Uh, so I'll be speaking about the migratory species of Lake Superior, uh, the differences between the North Shore and the South Shore uh, fishing. Uh, I'll show you some cool fish data. I'll show you where you can catch these fish. I'll tell you when the best time to catch them is. I'll you, tell you what you need to catch them, as well as uh, some of the entomology the flies to use, how to rig. Um, and how to read water and a couple casting tips. So these are the migratory fish that are in Lake Superior. Um, probably going from the most abundant down. Um, so the main one and my favorite one to catch is the steelhead. Um, or a uh, migratory rainbow trout, um, which is the, all these fish are anadromous, which is a, a fish that lives its life in a lake, but uh, runs up a river to spawn. Um, so that's steelhead. There are brown trout. Uh, there are brook trout, coho salmon, uh, chinook salmon or king salmon, pink salmon. Um, there used to be uh, more Atlantic salmon. They're not really around anymore. You might really, you might be able to find them, but that's not really an option anymore. Um, and there's splake uh, stocked and some naturally reproducing. But really, the top six are um, the main migratory fish that that you can target. Um, so a little bit of difference between the North Shore and the South Shore, you would think that being so close to each other that all of the fish would <laughs> run in the North Shore and run in the South Shore and vice versa. Um, but there are quite a few differences in just the structure and topography of the North Shore and South Shore um, that really makes them different fisheries. Uh, so the North Shore is very steep. There's a lot of waterfalls, as you might know, um, and a lot of there's a lot more rivers, um, but a lot of them are pretty short and quick. Some of them have just well, a pool basically on the lake and then a barrier waterfall that the fish can't go past. Um, so each river on the North Shore has a, a barrier or a waterfall um, that keeps all of the steelhead, the pink salmon, and the coaster brook trout. Um, so those are the three species um, that you can catch on the North Shore. Um, and that separates them from the native brook trout that are living above the barriers. Um, so then on the South Shore, um, I guess before I get to the South Shore, you can catch, um, there will be occasional browns, there'll be occasional coho, um, there used to be a king salmon run, um, but there's not really any more. Um, so it's really just those three at the top. Um, but every once in a while, you, you have a chance to catch in something different. But on the South Shore, uh, there are pretty good opportunities to catch uh, rainbow trout, 
brown trout, coho salmon, and king salmon. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, the South Shore, unlike the North Shore, is a lot of their rivers are spring fed. Uh, they're longer. They stay colder. The fish can thrive in there a little better. So there's not as many rivers, but they are generally longer and are a better habitat for trout and salmon than the North Shore is. Um, so just split up between the, the spring and the fall. Um, on the North Shore, kind of your only option is steelhead. You can catch um, some other fish will run in the rivers just to kind of hang out, but they aren't really spawning. Um, as opposed to the fall, which is right now, which is kind of a smorgasbord. You can catch steelhead, browns, pinks, uh, coaster brook trout, kings, and coho. Uh, and then split up between native and introduced. So uh, brook trout are the only migratory trout in Lake Superior that is native. Um, there's also lake trout, but they don't uh, spawn in the rivers. So there's really only the one. Um, and the coaster brook trout used to be everywhere. That was the fish that would spawn on the North Shore. It was basically the only fish, well, it was the only fish that would spawn on the South Shore as well. Um, and in the past, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin has just introduced a bunch, bunch of different fish. Um, so the steelhead, the brown trout, kings, cohos, and pinks have all been introduced. Um, I think most of them on purpose. I've heard stories that pinks weren't maybe on purpose, but somehow they, they ended up here. Um, and there's been a couple different <laughs> steelhead. Um, there's a couple different strains of browns um, and there's still just kind of a, a little work <laughs> in progress. Um, so speaking of the different strains of fish, um, I talked about native and introduced. Um, so then we'll switch to stocked and wild. So all of the fish on the wild side aren't necessarily native. <coughs> they will reproduce without any help on their own. So all there's brook trout, uh, steelhead, browns, they, they can all do their thing um, and support themselves. On the North Shore, uh, for the last um, close to uh, probably 30 years, there was a fish called a Kamloops rainbow trout, which um, was more of a shore oriented rainbow trout that was not. Uh, so steelhead were overfished in the 90s. Um, and to fix the problem, these Kamloops were um, brought into the lake to add a fishery and have the ability for a catch and keep opportunity. Um, I could go into this uh, too long, so I'll just kind of cut it short and say the Kamloops and the steelhead were hybridizing. Uh, it was hurting the natural reproduction of the steelhead. So as of about four or five years ago, the Minnesota DNR is no longer stocking Kamloops rainbow trout. Um, however, they have switched and they are capturing steelhead as they're going up the Knife River um, taking their eggs and now they are stocking uh, genetically similar steelhead. So you can on the North Shore catch a fish that is missing uh, its adipose fin. Um, and if it is under 24 inches, uh, it will be a genetically similar steelhead that is stocked. And if it's above 25 or so inches, uh, most likely it's one of the last remaining cam loops. Um, and then uh, 
down here at the bottom, I also have brown trout. Um, Wisconsin does stock seaforellans. For the most part, they're a lake run fish, but I've heard that they might run up into some of the rivers and there's a chance of catching those. Um, and then also splake, which are under wild and under stocked. Uh, Wisconsin will stock some of those and I have caught some stocked uh, splake before. And then real quick, uh, after the fish spawns, uh, if you notice any difference between the fish on the die after spawn and the ones on the return to lake side, uh, all the ones that are die after spawn are your salmon. So in the fall, when the salmon run up the rivers and spawn, they will die. Um, and then all of their offspring are what we have left. Um, and then return to the lake are your trout, your rainbow trout, uh, brown trout, brook trout, that they will spawn and then head back out into the lake. All right, now what we all came here to see is big fish picks. I'm, I'm sure you're all excited about that. So this is a, uh, a North Shore steelhead. I'm going to go through some of the North Shore fish quick just to show you if you're not familiar with what they look like. Um, the rainbows, when they first come in the river, are bright, shiny. You may have heard the term chromer. Um, they are usually just super bright and silvery. And then once they've been in the river for maybe a week or two, they start to get some color. They turn kind of a greenish on top with a, a cool looking red kind of purpley band down the middle. Um, and you can see just above my hand, that's the adipose fin. So that's just an easy way to tell that this is a, a wild steelhead and not a, a stocked fish. Um, So these are pink salmon, um, and actually three of these fish I just caught three days ago on the North Shore. So the pink salmon are in the rivers right now. They generally run after the first big rain in September, um, and that happened just last week. And so they're in. If you are new to fishing migratory fish, pink salmon are an awesome option to fish for. Um, they, you can sight fish for them. So if you go up the river and you look in a river, they'll be in pretty shallow, clear water and they tend to school up. Um, and you can usually see their bright white bellies as they swim around. Um, so it's pretty easy to find them. Uh, I will get into the gear and stuff a little bit later, but they'll eat the same stuff that most migratory fish will eat, um, which is eggs, nymphs, streamers, stuff like that. Um, these three fish I all caught on a white and pink streamer. Uh, so this is a coaster brook trout, also caught on the North Shore. Uh, if you are targeting pink salmon, there's a good chance that you could catch a coaster brook trout. Um, Pink salmon are fairly abundant. And like I said, they die after they spawn. Um, so if you are going to keep fish, a pink salmon would be a good option. Um, other than the fact that I have eaten one and they are not good, <laughs> but um, it's still an option. Um, but if you are fishing for them, there's a chance that you'll catch a coaster brook trout. Um, and these are pretty special fish. They, um, like I said, used to be in all of the rivers, the North Shore, the South Shore, Lake Superior was their lake until all of these other species were introduced. Um, they're not doing as well as they have in the past. Um, so if you do catch one of these fish, uh, handle it very gently and, and put it back in the water because they're very cool. Um, so I talked about the Kamloops rainbow trout here. I'm long arming a, a big one. This one <laughs> I caught last spring. Um, it was one of the remaining loopers. If there are any left this year, they're probably going to be 30 inches or bigger. Um, but you can see <laughs> the circle that this one is missing the adipose clip or adipose fin. 
Um, and also this one, I'm kind of covering it up with my thumb. Uh, this is a splake. And this is a splake that was stocked by the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, but I caught it in uh, mid shore river on the North shore um, last fall. So that fish probably came out of Shawamigan Bay, swam across the river uh, or across the lake and up a river. And so they're also a cool fish. Okay, South shore stuff. Um, steelhead on the South shore. So this was also caught just last week, um, a pretty bright steelhead. They are already in the rivers. Um, it's the beginning of the run, but I will go through some of the data and show you when the best time to go catch these guys is. Um, so they are very similar to the North Shore, but like I was saying, how the North Shore and South Shore are so close, I think they would it would all be the same fish kind of going back and forth. Um, other than that splake that swam across, um, the steelhead tend to stick to their shores. So if you catch a North Shore steelhead, that fish will go out in the lake and then go back in the North Shore. And for the most part, they don't really travel um, across and go into the South Shore and North Shore. Um, there is a better chance of catching a longer fish on the North Shore because there is an option to keep fish over 26 on the cruel. <clears throat> which I don't recommend, but it's an option. Uh, but that does keep the the length down. So it's harder to catch a true 30 inch steelhead on the South shore. Uh, here are a couple browns that were caught on the South shore, uh, one by my buddy and one by our new board member, uh, Andrew St. Croix, a uh, big bright yellow buck on the left and a, a purdy hen on the right. Yeah, so a couple of coho salmon. Um, this, I believe these were both on the Brule, one uh, way down south on the upper Brule um, and the other one on a mid shore. Uh, the, the one on the left is one of Carl Hansel's clients. Uh, and on the right, you probably recognize um, our executive director, Brent Knotbaum with a nice coho from a couple of years ago. So, and then also some kings. I uh, have not been able to find a king to catch on the fly. Um, it's still a bucket list fish, uh, but Carl has figured it out. Uh, and these are all fish that Carl has caught on the fly. So this one, uh, I didn't mention at all before. This was a little bit of a mystery. Uh, when we were fishing, my buddy caught this tiger trout on the South shore last fall. Um, and it's just a pretty special fish. Uh, tiger trout are a cross between um, a brook trout and a brown trout. I think down in the drift list, there's also options to catch these, but I was pretty excited to see that fish. All right, uh, so some fish data. Uh, the cool thing about um, the Brule specifically on the South shore is that there is a lamprey barrier um, that will funnel all of the fish in front of a camera. Um, and someone has the awesome, probably monotonous and eventually boring job of counting every single fish that passes through the camera. Um, and as you can see, it's thousands of fish every year. So this Jason, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is a little bit of an eye chart for the folks watching live. So you might want to just explain the graph a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So I got three more or two more charts after this one. Um, this one specifically <laughs> past 30 years of data. Um, so at the top here, you can see is the brown trout numbers. Um, so the dotted line shows that the average number of brown trout that go into the Brule River is roughly 3,800 um, every year. And then over here on the right, so this is last year's 
data. So last fall, 4,500 brown trout came in the river. Uh, two years ago, 5,600 into the river. Um, so it's just a good way to see uh, how the fishery is doing. Um, and it honestly seems to be doing pretty good. The last couple of years have, have been good years, uh, pretty good numbers. It was kind of lower um, around like 2010, 2012, um, but it's starting to pick up again. So down here, uh, coho salmon, similar thing. The last two years, there's been a pretty significant drop in coho. Um, but honestly, the two years before that were just way above average. Um, and then steelhead typically averages around 5,800 fish um, every year. And so last year was 6,144. So this next slide breaks down. So you can see here, I'll go back this at the bottom, 6,144 steelhead. Um, if I go to the next slide, you see that here, fall run steelhead was 6,144. So this is just one year's data. And instead of broken out by year, it's broken out by week. Uh, so this is a good um, way to tell when the fish are coming in the rivers. And you can tell by the brown trout, this darker label that they start to come into the river in July and they've been coming in every week um, and they'll keep coming in for the rest of the fall. Um, the coho kind of peak around September. Um, so they're coming in now and then the steelhead has started probably a month or two ago um, and just typically continues to get more and more as the fall goes on. Um, so you can see brown trout, Chinook. Um, so there is, it's not a huge run. That's usually around three to 400 uh, king salmon or Chinook salmon run into the pool. Um, and then the coho 1,600, which is a little low, uh, the 6,000 steelhead, no brook trout. Uh, so they did see 14 pink salmon, uh, but good luck finding 14 pink salmon in 20 miles of river <laughs> and six flake. Um, so those are kind of hard to target on the South shore. Um, and then just real quick, a little comparison between the fall and the spring. So I said, you can catch um, steelhead on the South shore in the fall and the spring. They generally will uh, make their way into the river in the spawn in the fall and then hang out uh, in the upper river. Uh, there's a couple big lakes and it doesn't freeze over with all the springs so they can just hang out. Uh, then they'll start to spawn in um, the spring and as well as more steelhead will come up into the rivers in the spring. Um, so yeah, the fall is the best time to get your, your brighter fish, um, but the spring has generally more fish because you get the fall run dropping out of the river while you get the spring run coming into the river. Uh, and just a cool little tidbit from the last year's um, survey. So 83% of the steelhead uh, last year were between 20 and 25 inches long, weighed between three and five pounds, and were between four and five years old. Um, so that's your biggest chunk of fish are that lower 20s. Um, and then down at the bottom, 6% were skipjacks, which is your teenage steelhead. Um, so kind of the life cycle of the steelhead are smolt when they're around four or five, six inches. Um, then they will go into the lake for usually about two years. They may come into the river again as skipjacks when they're teenagers and they just kind of hang out and cause trouble and then go back out. And then when they're um, usually, well, I guess four or five years old, um, they're in their lower twenties and that's when they're adult steelhead. And then 
9% uh, of them were over 26 inches long. So, and I'm not sure how many of those were way over 26. But. All right. So we know what fish are out there, but now we need to know where to go to fish for them. Um, and on the North shore, like I said, it's really like I can give general rivers and spots, but it's every river. If there's flow, um, there's going to be a steelhead that's trying to go up it. Um, so basically any of the rivers on the North shore are good. There's a couple bigger ones um, that take more fish. Um, like the knife is good, the baptism, um, the Brule River in Minnesota, like all of those are big but good, uh, take large runs of fish um, and very accessible trails going right to the river. You don't have to do a lot of hiking and bushwhacking to find them. Um, and the one thing, like I mentioned before, but want to just reiterate is that there is a boundary. Um, so if you are hiking up and you pass the boundary, you're no longer fishing in my migratory waters that you're up above the barriers where it's only brook trout and maybe from some creek chubs. So, Jake, Jake, here. I, I do want to stress, um, so on the South shore, there are lots of rivers. Um, I, I do want to stress highly, um, there's, there's not just the Brule on the South shore. Um, it's not a secret river, it's the President's River. Um, people have been fishing it for a ton of years. Um, but one of the things that's happening recently um, is there, there's a lot of spots on the river that are owned by private landowners. Um, and for the past, really forever, um, they've allowed fishermen to access the water. Um, they've asked that you don't have fires and you don't make a mess. Um, but in the last year, there has been um, just a couple bad apples, a couple um, just fishermen that have ruined it for the rest of us. Um, so, and I, I don't want to preach at you guys. I'm sure you're all um, respectful and are good anglers, um, but I just want to stress that it's a really slippery slope at the moment. Um, there's been a handful of private lands that have closed last fall, uh, this spring, and then even this fall, even, even more are closing. Um, and they're super nice people. They've been helping us and allowing us to fish the river and walk through their land for years. Um, so I just want to stress, if you do go to the Brule, which is a great fishery, there's lots of fish. It's a tough fishery to figure out, um, but it's, it's really cool. But if you do go, please know where the private land is um, and don't trespass, um, pick up after yourself, uh, just kind of do, do all the right things. <laughs> all right, so that's, that's about all I got for that. Okay, so when to fish for each of these fisheries. Um, if you're not used to fishing for migratory fish, um, flows may not matter as much. Um, I know like even this summer in the driftless water got really low and it got tough and clear. Um, and it also did on the North shore. Even more so on the North shore than the South shore. Um, but, but river flows um, are important in that the, the higher the flow, generally the bigger push of fish. So when you see big spikes here, 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 um, that's generally pushing fish into the river. 
Um, but each river has a different flow and where it will blow out. Um, so this was just recently, this is last week, um, the river, the gruel was chocolate milk high, pretty unfishable after it got up to 350. Um, so that's something that you just kind of have to figure out to know each river um, and how high it can get. There's rivers like the Minnesota Brule that can run at 1200 and still be totally fishable. Um, but generally the little, the declines are the best after it spikes and then starts to drop off. That's my personal um, best time, favorite time to fish. All right. How are we doing on time? Am I going like, <laughs> I'm probably doing okay. Okay, so we'll talk about the gear. Um, I'm gonna just, so there's lots of different ways to catch these fish. Um, I'm going to cover two of the most popular ways. Um, one just briefly, and then if you guys have questions about it at the end, we can come back and cover it. Um, so first, this is kind of a newer thing, um, but I'm sure many of you have heard of swinging. Um, there are two different kind of styles of swinging, uh, Skagit and Scandi. Uh, I'm just covering Skagit as it's generally the better way to fish uh, our rivers because you can use sink tips, bigger flies. Uh, you, it's not as big as rivers. Um, so that's just kind of what I'll cover quick. Um, the best rod for that is probably an 11 foot seven weight switch rod, which is a two-handed rod. Um, if you get a reel for it, just make sure it balances well with the reel so you're not holding the tip up um, as you're swinging your streamer across. Um, and then basic running line, uh, a Skagit head, you can get a couple different sink tips. Um, and then leader, I typically use 10 to 15 pound mono or fluoro. Uh, and then everyone has their favorite flies, um, basically intruder flies, muddlers, uh, you can use woolly buggers, any of those things work. It's one of those types of fishing that it takes a long time to catch a fish and it's pretty difficult, but when you do, it's probably the most fun way to catch fish. Um, let's see. So the rest of the, I'm going to go a little more in depth on nymphing because I feel like that's um, what the majority of you would probably be interested in. Um, so my favorite rod for migratory steelhead, brown trout, coho, king, um, the majority of this stuff is a 10 foot seven weight. Uh, the 10 foot is very helpful for mending. Um, and also for fighting a fish. The longer your rod, you have a little more bend, a little more forgiveness. Um, it's just better. Um, you can definitely get away with a nine weight um, or a nine foot, but nine to 10 feet is kind of where you want to be at. And then seven weight is about perfect. You can get away with a six weight, uh, but it's a little light. I would not bring a nine foot five weight um, to do any migratory fishing. It's maybe doable, but it would be uh, pretty stressful on the fish because you won't be able to get it in and it's just really not worth it. So if you're gonna do this um, for a while, I, that's kind of my recommendation. Um, and then a real, uh, unlike bass fishing, other trout fishing, uh, the reel's just holding line for a migratory fish, you definitely want a reel with a, a smooth drag. Doesn't need to be extremely powerful, but having one that's smooth is pretty important. Um, and then backing 20 to 30 pounds is fine. And then line, um, I really like to overline my rods. So my seven weight, I'm typically using eight weight line. And the eight weight line I use is typically overlined I believe one and a half times. So I'm really using basically a nine weight line on a seven weight rod. Um, but with the amount of stuff that I'll show you on the next slide that you need at the end of your 
line um, and the the long distances that you'll need to cast, it's really helpful to have a heavier line to be able to pull everything out of the water and cast it efficiently. Um, my personal favorite line is the SA Anadryl line. Um, the other thing about these lines, you can get away with really any floating line, um, but the good thing about these Anadryl lines or an indicator steelhead specific line is the length of the belly. So you can see this one tapers at your whole head section is about 60 feet, which means when you're making a 50 foot, 60 foot cast um, that you're able to still mend the line and which is pretty important. Uh, so going down from the line, uh, we have the leader. I typically run a pretty standard leader. Um, I have been switching out quite a few different things, but right now I've settled on a seven foot zero X nylon tapered leader. Uh, and the nylon is important. I wouldn't get a fluorocarbon leader uh, if you're indicator fishing because it will be pulling everything under the water and it's just gonna be a pain. Um, so nylon for that, but tippet, I use uh, one, two or three X, which is roughly eight to 12 pound uh, test. And that I strictly use fluorocarbon uh, for a couple of reasons. It's, uh, it has less buoyancy. It's, uh, it has a, it's clearer, so it doesn't spook the fish as much. Um, it's abrasion resistant. Um, pretty much everything about it is better than nylon, um, at least on the section below the water that the fish see, other than it is expensive. Like a spool of nylon tip, it's about five bucks and fluoro's 15. So it is expensive, but I think if you're gonna do it, it is worth it. Um, and then indicators, I use airlocks. Um, Phil, I think they're ice and fly um, bobbers and also blackbird um, floats. And the blackbird floats are more of a center pin style um, fishing, um, but they've worked pretty good for specific scenarios. So I use those as well. Um, but the airlocks are my favorite. If you can find those, that's where it's at. Um, get the three quarter inch size way better than the thingamabobs, doesn't kink your line, you can move it up and down, highly recommended. Not sponsored by Airlock, but you should, you should get some of those. Um, so bugs, flies, and a little more rigging. Um, on the Brule specifically, and uh, I'm sure the rest of the South Shore, and I believe even the North Shore, um, there are two main bugs that, you, that you'll see. Um, on the left is a tenarsis that I found on the gruel, and then in uh, Acronuria, which is just a golden stonefly. That one I, I was just fishing yesterday and snagged a log and pulled it up and, and found that guy. So those are your kind of main two, um, if you're fishing flies uh, to try to represent. Um, the tenarsis will get pretty big. So your fish in size is like six um, and eight, like three X long curve nymph hooks. And then your acronuria um, is a lot of like 10, 12, 14, uh, like pheasant tails, prince nymphs, hare's ears, stuff like that, um, like this stuff. So this is, you can kind of see here is a uh, jigged flashback pheasant tail, um, the famous uh, superior X legs, a Kaufman stone, soft tackle, Frenchy patch rubber legs, prince nymph, uh, pheasant tail, and then egg flies. Um, so these are bugs that I've caught steelhead on probably all of them. Um, so I know that they work. Um, and eggs is the other. So these, these fish are eating all sorts of stuff. They'll they're coming in from the lake. They're eating minnows and leeches and and other fish's eggs and bugs and and all sorts of stuff. Um, but if you're nymphing, this is kind of your 
your best bet um, to tie on the line. So the leader setup, um, like I talked about before, uh, I like using that seven foot zero X nylon leader. Um, and I like just thinking about my leader in third. So my top third is my indicator section. So I will move my indicator anywhere. Um, sometimes I'll, it'll be on the, the middle third, but for the most part, my indicator is up top. Um, and then I will put split shot on the middle third. And then I keep my bottom third for flies. Um, an important thing is the North Shore, you can only have one fly if you're fishing below the barrier. So for any anadromous fish, if you're steelheading on the North Shore, got to be one. Um, but on the South Shore, you can use two flies. Um, so this is my standard um, South Shore setup. And then I taper everything down. So I start with a 0x nylon leader. I will typically tie it on to a an ant swivel or a micro swivel. Um, and that just helps out that if you break your um, line that you don't have to keep eating away at your leader. Uh, it just acts just like a tippet ring um, and it's easier to tie. I usually tie a Palomar knot onto the top of the swivel um, just because it's a little bit stronger. And then I just will do clinch knots basically all the way down. Um, but on this South Shore, I run like an 18 inches of 2X fluoro to my top fly and then another 18 to my uh, bottom fly. So, and like I said, the tapered, it helps with turning over and it also helps if you snag your bottom fly that you don't break everything off. You just lose your bottom fly and it's a lot less work so you can keep fishing, which is what we all want. So I'm gonna cover three different rigging options. Um, there are, I, I wanna stress that there's a lot of different ways to fish. Um, I fish a lot with uh, Brent Knopbaum, uh, Carl Hansel, John Lincheski that you all have probably heard of. They all fish different ways and I fish different from them, but they all work, um, they all catch lots of fish, um, but it one depends on how you're fishing, where you're fishing. Um, and I like to just be modular. So I, I want to be able to change how my split shot is on my leader, change where my indicator is, uh, change up my flies, um, and just be able to quickly adapt to uh, a different situation. If I am walking up the river and I want to fish a shallow riffle, or if I want to fish a deep pool or behind a rock, um, I can just move a couple of things and I'm ready to go. So this first one is kind of the basics on how I fish shallower ripply water. Um, so on the top, this just kind of shows the setup. And then on the left um, is at least in my head what I think it's doing under the water. So if it was uh, moving from right to left here, uh, your indicator would be going down the water and then down to your split shot. Um, and then I generally like to have one or two weightless flies that will float up above the split shot. So you know you're close to the bottom and your other flies are just kind of drag free drift flowing down the, the current. Um, the other option, so this is fairly similar to the first option, but I generally like this type of setup for medium water. Um, one of the main differences that you may have noticed is that I do like spacing out my split shot. Uh, so this middle chunk, uh, my split shot third of the leader, I changed from the shallow version, which has two split shot close to the swivel. And then the medium version, I have three split shot spaced farther apart. Um, and then typically I'll also use a weighted fly. Um, and it's usually jig just so I don't get hung up as much. But this is probably my, my favorite uh, way to fish when I start out. And then I might adjust as the day goes on. Um, and then this is the 
what I call the Brett knot bomb. <laughs> uh, he fishes, um, he taught me this. Um, it's more of a vertical presentation. So there's, and I don't think he uses four split shot. Um, I will just to balance out my float. So it's sitting uh, perfectly up and down and I'll add split shot. If it's not, then I'll add split shot up close to the float to get it running how I want. Um, but generally you're running heavier flies and everything's heavier and you're running deep um, and you want this bottom fly to be just kind of ticking bottom as you go. So this is a great option if you're fishing a, a big deep pool. Um, but none of these, you're not cutting any line off. You're not changing really anything other than maybe a fly and then moving some split shot around. Um, so yeah, the different spots on the river that you can fish. So once you get there uh, and you found a spot, you know there's fish in the river, uh, where are you gonna target? Um, there's lots of different options. There's the heads of pools, the pool itself or the bucket, um, the tail out once it starts to shallow up. Um, and then there are also seams, rocks, wood, and foam. And if you can combine uh, more of those together, even better. So if you're fishing a spot that uh, the head dumps into a big bendy pool um, that makes a big foam line, the foam line runs against some wood, and then there's a rock like in the bottom of a pool and you can run that seam line you're checking off like five of these options and there's a good chance there's going to be a, a fish there um, so the one saying i like is wood is good but foam is home so foam is probably more important than wood um, and this is just a little visualization on that um, those, the little start to these lines are up in the head where it's probably a couple feet deep um, and then it dumps into a big pool. Um, one major thing uh, is if you are used to fly fishing but you're not used to nymphing and you're not used to nymphing for migratory fish is that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven different things that are all moving on your leader. So if you overhand cast even one time, you will be spending the next five, 10 minutes untangling it. So rule number one, no overhand casting when you're, when you're doing any of this. Uh, swinging, nymphing, uh, it's strictly roll casting and water loaded casting, um, which is just after your drift, letting the current take your flies and then using the water tension um, of the flies that allows you to bend your rod and cast back upstream again. So, wow, that was quick. So that's all I got for you. Um, I think we're doing good for time. Um, yeah, if you want to learn more, like I said, you can check out my website. Um, you can follow me at Jason Swinging on Instagram. Uh, if you do want to book a trip, I am guiding it uh, with Nama Binny. And if you stop up here, we got two great fly shops, uh, the Superior Fly Angler in Superior, Wisconsin, and the Great Lakes Fly Shop in Duluth. Uh, great guys that work there, good selections, uh, fun spots to fish. Um, and then just remember, if you do go fishing, uh, respect the land and respect the fish. And that's all I got. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Somebody's applauding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I think you ended probably in just the right amount of time because I suspect we're gonna start getting a lot of questions. Uh, I see already we have some items in the chat and uh, I'm going to let Brandon turn on his uh, turn on his speaker. I think Brandon, I hope. Yep, I'm here. I got okay. it. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So great work, Jason. I uh, I do have a list of questions that have come in. Um, it looks like I may be uh, capturing a few more. Uh, but the first question that came in, Jason, was 
um, from Brian Ruggle. And uh, it's a question about the airlock indicator. So does the line go on top of or below the rubber washer? Essentially, does he need to take the washer off to put the line on? If you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, very good question. Um, I do not take the washer off. I think you can. I think it does the same thing, uh, but you will drop the washer in the water. Um, just it, it'll happen. So you just have to take this top little piece of plastic off and then you lay your line. There's a little slot that you'll lay it on top of the, the rubber bushing and then you put the um, plastic cap back on. And then when you change your uh, depth here, um, you don't have to take the whole thing off. Um, so just do one quick turn, move it to where you want and tighten it back down. Great. Um, next question here comes from Ernie Steck. And uh, Ernie just asked, any comments on fishing in the Nipigon River, Jason? Um, that's a spot that I've never gone, but a definite bucket list fish. Um, I know they have giant coaster brook trout, and I hope one day to get up there and then give you firsthand experience on <laughs> what I know about it. Great. Um, next question uh, comes from Brandon Schmidt, Schmitz, or Schmaltz, excuse me. Um, can you go into more detail on why you don't use floral leaders? I know you talked about floral tippet, but why not a full floral leader? Yeah, so one of the problems when you are fishing, um, you're doing real big men's, and a lot of times the currents, um, there's forces that pull down. And if your line gets sucked under the water, you can no longer mend because you're pulling your, you need the line to be on the water to lift it and place it to get a drag free drift. Um, and if you have a floral leader, because floral sinks at a faster rate than nylon does, um, the floral leader itself will start to pull your fly line below the surface and it just makes mending harder. Um, so it's more expensive and it just makes it more difficult. So I, I avoid floral leaders. Great. Um, next question is actually mine, uh, Jason. Uh, so you talked a, a little bit about rig number two. Um, curious to know how much distance you put between those shots. And then on that uh, water two, do you dictate the, the depth or the speed of that water and you add more split shot then? Yeah, good question. Um, there is no definite distance. Um, I change constantly. So I did split this up into like rig one, two, and three, um, but there is a lot of um, change in between them. So I, I will, um, really constantly be adding split shot, taking it away, uh, changing the distance, um, just depending on the drift. Um, so I, I like, um, I guess generally the split shot are probably eight inches apart on average, if I do space them apart, um, maybe 10, maybe 12. Um, but the nice thing when you space, so, this little diagram on the left, if you're fishing a run um, that has a lot of change in depth, I really like using this method um, because if you have all of your split shot tucked into one big pile and you're fishing um, and all of a sudden there's a big rock or it comes up and goes back down, all those split shot are gonna snag and your drift ends. Um, but if you space your split shot out, there's a better chance that your bottom split shot might hit and then you can roll over it. So you can fish a greater variety of depth um, with your space, with your split shot spaced out rather than all tucked in a little ball. Um, but there's certain spots where it's really deep and I need to get down really fast and just scoop out a hole. 
Um, and then this is really your best option. So I will change back and forth between all three of these in one spot just by adding split shot, taking them away. Um, sometimes I will make the distance between the indicator and the fly longer. And sometimes I just need more split shot. Um, but there's usually a, a, a certain point where you keep lengthening up and keep lengthening up and it's worth just putting more split shot on instead. So it's all, it's not really a, a perfect way to do it. Great. Thank you. One last question on that, on that, on these diagrams, Jason, with the split shot, um, are you putting that right on that seven foot leader then that you shared with everybody? Um, and then, uh, and then, or are you adding additional uh, tippet and that's where you're putting all your split shot on and focusing on that? Um, I am putting it right on the leader. So okay. this spot is one. Um, one piece of line. One, yeah. Okay, great. Perfect, thanks. And okay. if you want more, if there's no problem with um, adding a chunk right here, um, I would just like blood knot on some zero X nylon and then make that section my, my split shot section. Okay, okay, great. All right, um, have a question here from Charles uh, Felt. And uh, his question is, uh, he's heard that trout and salmon inhale the egg pattern deeper than other flies. And with that, egg flies are harder to remove from the fish. Is that something you've noticed uh, with your time on the water? Um, I guess, no, I haven't personally noticed it that much. Um, and I didn't really mention, um, there's also, so there's this yarn egg, there's a couple different options for egg patterns. Um, a lot of times I'll fish a bead, either a hard bead or a soft bead, um, and that pegs the bead um, two inches above the hook, which kind of has its own little controversy because you're fishing a, a bare hook. Um, but that seems to be the best option um, that I've never fouled hooked a fish doing that, and I've never hooked a fish deep doing that. Um, so I've never, I've never had a personal problem with hooking fish too deep with any fly. Okay, great. Uh, another question here is from uh, Tom Orkfritz. And uh, Tom asks, uh, he only has a five weight nine foot rod. And you talked a little bit about this earlier, Jason, but uh, unfortunately he's not in the market to be able to purchase a new rod. So with that setup, any suggestions for locations where that would work for him or others that have just a five weight Rod. Yeah. Um, so I talked about the 10 foot seven weight is your perfect steelhead brown trout coho. Um, if you're just getting into it and have a five weight uh, North Shore pink salmon, a nine foot five weight is like the perfect rod. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're if you want to go catch some pink salmon, like you have the setup and that's already ready to go. Um, you, I don't know, I guess in the fall, um, on the South shore, the fish, like I said, are more straight out of the river. Um, and they will fight and jump and pull. Um, and I've had some fish even on a seven weight that I almost, couldn't land. Um, so I think you would have a hard time in the fall. I think in the spring, the fish are dropping back. Um, if you want to do a South shore, I don't really want to recommend a five weight, but if you're going to do it, it's a better time in the spring than the fall. Sounds good. Um, I have another question here from William Marks. And uh, what is your single fly setup for the North Shore? Um, so it is pretty similar. It would be, so on the North Shore, I'm typically running this uh, rig one type of option for most, um, most of the time. And then I'm either running um, just a single egg pattern 
or just a single a single stonefly. So on the North Shore, um, right when the river is open. So the other quick difference between the North Shore and South Shore is that there's seasons on the South Shore since it's spring fed, um, the rivers, uh, the fish can be in the rivers all the time. So there's regulated times when you can fish. Um, the North Shore, since they're just in there for a short period of time, uh, you fish as soon as the fish are in the rivers, which is typically right after uh, ice melt and all the ice pulls out of the rivers, um, the fish will, will swim up under the ice. So as soon as you can get out there, um, yeah, you can fish the North Shore. But yeah, that's if that answered it. I, it's just one fly, either an egg. Uh, earlier in the season, eggs are better. And then once the water warms up, um, there's a, a time uh, that they generally will switch and start eating more bugs than eggs, but it's one or the other. Great. I um, have another question here. Uh, actually got a couple more coming in. Nice work, everyone. We're going to keep you busy, Jason. <laughs> um, this is from uh, Forrest Flint. And Forrest just asked, are there any other rivers on the South Shore other than the Brule worth fishing? Um, yes. There are. Um, I haven't done a ton of exploring. I know you can catch fish in like the onion and um, even the, what is it, the, the middle river. Um, yeah, I haven't done a ton of exploring. I know that you can. I've gone to some spots that people have taken me that uh, I won't say in front of everyone else, um, but sure, there's there's plenty of other rivers. Um, it's kind of one of those, if you're tired of seeing people um, and wanna just go do something adventurous, um, it, it'll probably pay off to go find your own section on a different river. All right, uh, got another question here from Brian Ruggo. Brian's question is, is there fishing right in the Duluth rivers or above North Shore barriers in the fall? Um, yes, there. So right now I was talking about on the North Shore in the fall, your basic options are pink salmon, um, coaster brook trout, and then occasional you might find a steelhead. Um, but right in Duluth, the Duluth rivers there are currently pink salmon um, in them below the barriers and then above the barriers there's always always your brook trout oh i think you're muted brandon are you yeah thanks jason sorry about that um another question just came in so from charles phelps uh, question is, how far up the rural uh, do the steelhead go to spawn? This is the rural uh, on the south shore of Wisconsin. Yeah, they will go way, way, <laughs> I guess, south. Um, yeah, so there's a couple. There's Big Lake. Um, there, They'll go past uh, Stones Bridge. Um, so they'll go pretty much the whole way over the winter. They'll be in some pretty far stretches of the, of the brule. Um, and then some of them will spawn up there uh, even before the season starts. Um, so there's a chance that some of them are just up there spawning and, and doing their thing. But um, yeah, they're, they're in there. They go way up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Um... I don't, there aren't any other questions that have come in other than just a lot of comments here, Jason. Nice work. Thank you. Um, so um, nice presentation, Jason. One last question or comment here was uh, from John Aspie and John just said, note that brook trout fishing above the barriers uh, in Minnesota closes at the end of September. So uh, we're coming up on that date uh, for those that are interested in coming up this way. Uh, nice note, John. Thank you. Good to, good to know. That's it, though. Uh, Bob, I, I'll keep kind of monitoring the online chat here and just jump in. But uh, the folks there at the 
uh, in person have some questions, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Uh, would you guys like the lights turned up a little bit? We turned them down for the presentation. If you want, maybe Eve, can you turn the light up a little bit? Uh, so, yeah. uh, I, guys, uh, unfortunately, Jason's probably not able to see you because he sees me on the screen, but I'm afraid if, this, if I move this computer to show you guys, then I'm going to uh, somehow screw up the projector. So if you just ask your question, he'll probably be able to hear you, but I'll uh, repeat his question. And uh, who is that? Jim. Jim. We have a question from Jim, whose wife let him come tonight. All right. I just had a quick question. I noticed that you do a little small mouthing. So uh, what kind of a rig would you use on a small mouth? So yeah. the, you heard that, Jason? I think so. Uh, so you asked what type of rig I'd use for small mouth fishing. Yeah. Right. Um, so rod and reel. Um, you can get away with a lot of different things. Um, I think an eight to a nine foot length is the best. Um, and you can use anything from probably a five weight to an eight weight. Um, it's more fun on five weight, but if you want to throw bigger stuff, I like an eight weight. Um, probably a nine foot six is your best option. Um, and then I'm using, uh, I usually build my own leader so i'm using a, a weight forward heavy tapered shooting fly line um i will use uh either build my own leader out of like 25 pound down to 12 pound mono uh, and then i fish a lot of poppers uh dahlbergs and then smaller streamers um if i can catch them on a pop popper that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I'll also use a streamer. And then I, so I have a couple different setups. I, I usually use the floating line for poppers and then I'll usually carry another one with a sink tip that I use for streamers. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. What, what about a center pin rod? Do you ever fish with center pin rods? And what do you think of them? <laughs> Um, I have never fished with a center pin rod. Um, I, I think that they're probably one of the most efficient ways to catch fish. If, if you have a center pin rod, like when you're fly fishing, you're trying to make a drag free drift. Um, so there's kind of a, a nice when you have fly line, it's easier to cast up and down. You don't have to pull all your, or wind your line up every time. So the efficiency is nice, but you're constantly mending your line. Um, when I see people center pin fish, it just looks like so good. <laughs> like, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little jealous. I'm not getting into it. Um, I'm a fly fisherman now, um, but I have nothing against it. I think it's a good way to catch fish. Okay, good question. Other questions? So I, I do have a question for you, Jason. I actually, in the last 20 years, I've gone steelhead fishing once. I went with Chris O'Brien, who's here tonight. And Chris, I can't remember the name of the stream we were on. The Black Hoof. The Black Hoof, which flows north. Uh, and I think winds up someplace flowing in. But anyway, the things that I know about steelhead fishing are what I read about people steelhead fishing on the West Coast. And so I was using some salmon flies that a friend of mine in Japan tied for me and I was swinging them. So is that a way to catch steelhead or was I completely, I did catch one 13 inch brook trout, uh, but, uh, but I didn't hear anything about swinging or, or stuff like that. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. Yeah. Um, that is definitely a way to catch fish. Um, I didn't go into full detail, um, but swinging is definitely gaining popularity and a lot of fun. Um, you, you can catch them stripping streamers. Um, so if you have just, if you 
just need to overhand cast, like that's your opportunity. Um, you, you can do that. Um, but the two handed uh, swinging streamers really is ideal um, for slightly larger rivers. The Black Hoof um, might be, from what I know of that, it's a little small and a little snaggy. So yeah. I probably wouldn't bring a switch rod there. Um, but steelhead will definitely eat um, big spay flies. So that's an option. Okay, any other questions? I'm sorry, I do have one more question too. Uh, you were talking a lot about making long casts. Here in the driftless area, I'm used to, to, to be a long cast is 25 feet. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, do you have to make long casts? What are the advantages of making long casts? Is there any advantage to trying to be stealthy and doing really good, you know, 25 or 30 foot casts? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you can definitely catch fish without uh, long drifts. Uh, um, one quick thing, the the anadromous fish aren't as spooky as they, as like the driftless, the water is um, usually dirtier, it's bigger. You can get away with a little bit more commotion. Um, not that you should just jump in the water and, and splash around. Um, but for most of the spots, the longer your drift um, can be, the better. Uh, for one main point is that when you're casting up, um, so if you cast uh, 30 feet up and you're, let's see here. so like this setup, um, you cast 30 feet up, your indicator lands, then your split shot and all your flies land on the water and then the current takes it down, it'll take a good 10 feet until your flies are already all at the bottom. If you're fishing a, a pool that's maybe five to seven feet deep. Um, so if you're making a 30 foot cast up 10 feet of that, you're not really fishing. You're just getting to the zone. Um, and then similarly to the end, when your line gets taut, um, your flies pull out and they're not on the bottom anymore. So if you're doing 30 foot cast up, you're covering 60 feet of water, um, but really only 40 feet of that is fishing. Um, and then if you cut that down and you're only making a 20 foot cast, then your 40 feet turns into 20 feet. Um, so really the longer cast you can make, the better um, to a point. Um, there's also your, you can get way down river, uh, catch a hook a fish, set it, and you're just pulling it out of its mouth. It, it's hard to bite. Um, but generally, if you can make a longer drift, do it. But yes, you can definitely catch fish without really long drifts. Okay. Are there any other? Question. Yeah, I got a couple of questions came in online here, Bob. So I uh, got a question here from uh, Charles Phillips. What was your biggest surprise about fishing opportunities near Duluth having moved from Montana, Jason? Um, so everything was a surprise. Um, so I grew up in northeastern Montana where we didn't have trout streams. It would have taken a full day drive to get to a premier trout stream. Um, so I get that all the time, like, oh my gosh, you moved from Montana here, like this must not be, but I didn't start fly fishing until I moved here. Um, I was honestly a little against it uh, right away. I was pretty content spin fishing. And then I found out I could catch bass on flies and I could start tying flies. And then I found I can catch bigger fish on smaller flies and got into steelheading. And now I can't imagine doing anything else.
All right, then got a question here from uh, Toby Haley. Um, his question is, uh, I think this is more tuned to swinging, Jason. Uh, he's asking, could he use a T22 line for, for on the barrel? Um, I don't know if you would need to. I think if it's a 10 foot section, a T, I don't even know, T22, that's, that seems excessive. Um, I don't know. I, I typically use T11, um, either 10 foot or uh, a mo tip that's um, five foot floating, five foot of T11. Sometimes I'll do T14. Um, but I know Toby knows how to catch fish on the swing. So I think if he wants to use some, some real fast sinking stuff, he should keep doing it because I know he's been getting after it. All right, I don't have anything else here, Bob. Great okay. question. We just had Hillary Pinella enter the waiting room. Welcome, Hillary. We're just about to uh, <laughs> end the meeting. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the live audience? Uh, if not, uh, I guess uh, I'd like to first uh, extend our thanks to Jason. And if you're online, you can give him a virtual thumbs up or hand up in here. And in the Crooked Pint, we can actually give you a... Thanks, guys. Jason, that is the largest round of applause that we have had for a TCTU speaker in at least 18 months. <laughs> but uh, seriously, thank you very much. We think you did a great job and we really appreciate it. I, I'm going to, how can I turn off your screen share? There, I'm going to do that. I'm yeah. stopping your sharing. Perfect. So, uh, so anyway, thank you very much. And I, uh, uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, thanks for your patience with uh, a few uh, uh, technical issues. And uh, we will be sending out uh, more information, both to Gitchigumi and TCTU about upcoming chapter meetings. And particularly in October, if you get a chance, attend our film festival. Thank you and have a great night.